Welcome to MUFON Los Angeles. Our guest this evening, Nicholas Redfern, has been researching UFO mystery, the UFO mystery since the late 1970s. He has concentrated his investigations at an official level and has secured the release of thousands of previously classified files on UFOs from a host of government and intelligence agencies throughout the world, including Britain's Ministry of Defense and the USA's CIA and FBI. Speaking tonight on cos cosmic crashes, the British Roswells. Please help me welcome Nicholas Redfern. Thanks everybody and thanks Don and everybody at LA MUFON for inviting me and giving the chance to speak to you this evening. As Don mentioned, what I'd like to speak to you about is what could be broadly termed British Roswells. Accounts, rumours, stories, allegations that UFOs have crashed to earth in Britain and been retrieved in the same scenario as the so-called Roswell incident in the US. Well, what I'd like to do for you first is give you a little bit of background on the way in which the British government handles the UFO situation, how it investigates UFO reports, who gets to see UFO reports within the British military and within the government, and answer questions concerning allegations of conspiracy and cover-up, and really give you as much information as I can on the official story in 30 minutes or so and then branch off into the unofficial story if you like which centers around the crashed UFO reports so I can get this slide projector working okay okay just to give you a bit of background um, as Don mentioned, I've been interested in the UFO subject since the late 1970s. And I got interested because my father used to work in the British Royal Air Force, and he used to work on radar. And on several occasions in the early 1950s, they would have uh, reports of unusual fast-moving objects picked up on the radar scopes, very often in the early hours of the morning fast objects moving um, over Europe and heading towards mainland Britain. And at the time, of course, the first thought was this was possibly the Soviets launching some sort of secret attack, or at least probing our defences. But this would happen time and time again, to the extent that eventually it became clear that whoever was piloting these objects, it certainly wasn't the Russians, the Americans or the British. The reports, or the, the incidents, if you like, involved objects travelling at two, 3,000 miles an hour that would suddenly come to a complete halt, reverse, um, fly left and right. Aircraft were sent up to, in, to intercept these objects and pilots would report seeing large circular shaped objects in the sky that would play games of cat and mouse, hide and seek with them. And in every single case, that's, or every incident that this occurred, no harm came to the pilots or the air crews. National security, to an extent, was compromised because these things were entering British airspace, but on no occasion was outright hostility displayed. And so what happened was that um, teams came up from the British Ministry of Defence at Whitehall and interviewed everybody involved from the radar officials to the pilots to people on base who might know something about this particular incident or uh, further incidents and with the British Official Secrets Act in force everyone was reminded that they'd signed the OSA and if they wanted to hang on to their military pensions when they retired from work or from the service then the last thing they would want to do was speak to their family, uh, friends and certainly not to the media. So my dad did what all good military people do and he decided to tell me. And this really got my interest in the subject uh, fired up shall we say because at the time, I was probably 13, 14 years old. I hadn't really given the subject any thought at all. And when he related this account to me, it really not just got my interest going, but it convinced me of three things. One, that credible um, people were seeing UFOs, i.e. people trained in aircraft recognition, people trained to know what goes on in our skies. <clears throat> 
and the fact that all the incidents were in investigated rigorously by the Royal Air Force and the Ministry of Defence, this convinced me that whatever the government knew about the subject, it was carrying out in intense investigations and there was obviously a body of evidence somewhere. And thirdly, the fact that everybody involved was sworn to secrecy, that convinced me really that whatever was behind the UFO mystery, those in power didn't want the average person in the street knowing as well. And I always think that if there's something governments don't want us to know about, then more often than not it's something we should know about. So um, I then began looking further into the subject and began writing for newsletters and journals and really the research and the writing spiralled from there. But what I'd like to do before getting into the crashed UFO stories is talk about a little bit about the official story in Britain and how UFO investigations are carried out by the government. And that is a place just outside London called the Public Record Office. And the Public Record Office is very, very similar to your National Archives in Washington. It's where government and military agencies store files from, for example, not just the Ministry of Defence and the Royal Air Force, but MI5 and MI6, which are the British equivalents of your CIA and FBI, um, the government communications headquarters, which is the British NSA, police force, all sorts of agencies, the Army, Navy, etc., all keep their files at the Public Record Office. And in the same way that you have your Freedom of Information Act, in England we have something called the 30-year ruling. And this is a piece of government legislation which, as you can tell by its name, means that all government files, regardless of classification, are automatically withheld from the public for a minimum of 30 years. So in January 2002, that means certain government files dating up to 1972 can be released into the public domain. But everything from 72 onwards remains classified until it reaches at least 30 years of age, if you like. But other files, other documents can be withheld literally indefinitely. There are seven or eight pieces of legislation which allow for government files to be withheld, um, some concerning personal uh, matters, personal security, national security, things such as this. But with respect to UFOs, the Ministry of Defence have now released about 4,000 pages of UFO files dating back to approximately the mid-1940s um, and, and back to the reports of Foo Fighters and through to the late 1960s, early 1970s. That's another shot of the Public Record Office. I put that one on there because if you see the, the lake at the front of the photograph, well, beneath that lake is a huge underground storage area where all the official files um, are maintained. And I went down there once to do some filming with the BBC that actually allowed us to go into the vaults. And the floor to ceiling height is probably something about 25 feet. And extending under London, backwards and forwards, up and down, there is shelving, literally, which goes on for 96 miles which is where official files are, are withheld. And the files which are kept under there aren't just the um, declassified material, there's also the uh, material that's to be declassified as well that still um, that isn't in the public domain as yet. And the files themselves, when you actually go into the archives and have a look at the vaults, the unclassified material sits on the shelves next to the material that still hasn't been uh, released into the public domain. And many of the files, for example, have top secret written on them, and it might say Department of the Navy to be declassified 2045 or declassified 2070. And to give you an indication of how official secrecy works in Britain, there are files on the Royal Family at the Public Record Office which come up for declassification in January 2101, which of course none of us are going to get to see those, but it, it goes to show how easily and um, quite simply official secrecy can be maintained in Britain. Some of these documents, those at the front might be able to read them, Others of you at the back might not, so what I'll do is, is talk you through them and explain to you what they show and what they relate to. And that's one of the, the earliest documents that's been released by the Ministry of Defence um, to the general public. 
and it concerns a UFO sighting that occurred at a place called RAF Topcliffe in West Yorkshire, England in September 1952. And this there was a lot, of, a lot of sightings around the UK at this particular time and one of the incidents my father was involved in uh, was related to a, a series of events that occurred during a NATO operation called Mainbrace of which this particular encounter um, was another one. And it involved a disc-shaped object seen hovering over the airfield at RAF Topcliffe by five or six um, Royal Air Force personnel and all of them reported seeing this thing, stated it was 30 to 50 feet in diameter and hovered for a moment and then shot off at a, an incredible speed. None of them had ever seen anything like this before. And this particular report went right up the chain of command of the Ministry of Defence and purely because of the credibility of the witnesses, uh, a lengthy investigation was put into place. And since this particular document surfaced, um, a number of people involved in these incidents have now come forward, they feel more comfortable about speaking out now that the MOD have started to, report, to release reports on this particular case. But a number of people said, well, how can people such as myself argue that there's a government cover-up of UFO data in England if they're actively allowing us to see files such as these? And it's sort of a, a double-edged sword in the sense that in the same way that files surface in the US from the CIA or the FBI or whoever, we're getting to see part of the story within the UK. Now, there's no actual um, legislation that says the government must declassify these files. They're actually being released um, voluntarily by certain government agencies and certain departments within these agencies. So I feel personally that there are those within the government who want this story to come out and they're actively now releasing this material into the public domain. So we're getting to see part of the story, which is the official one I want to talk about first. That um, is a document titled Reports on Aerial Phenomena and it's a document that was forwarded throughout the Royal Air Force, the entire British Royal Air Force, in December 1953 and it concerns um, the reporting procedures put in place in the event that RAF personnel should see a UFO. And if I can just take the mic down. Just move out a little bit. Um, if you if you look at paragraph 2, this is the um, order put out to the Royal Air Force uh, what to do in the event that military personnel should see a UFO. It will be appreciated that the public attach more credence to reports by Royal Air Force personnel than to those by members of the public. It is essential that the information should be examined at Air Ministry and that its release should be controlled officially. All reports are therefore to be classified restricted and personnel are to be warned that they are not to communicate to anyone other than official persons any information about phenomena they have observed unless officially authorised to do so. So we have this situation we have this situation where as far back as December 1953 at least the Ministry of Defence had procedures in place officially warning all their employees not to talk about UFO encounters. And you'll see from the title the document's t called Reports on Aerial Phenomena. The Ministry of Defence actually will go, will do anything t to avoid using the terms flying saucer, UFO, unidentified flying object. Throughout the years they've used ter terms such as aerial phenomena, unexplained phenomena, and for some reason they don't like to draw attention to the word UFO. That's an update of that particular document uh, from 1956, as you can see at the top, classified secret. And this document was upgraded following a number of um, significant UFO sightings within the UK in August 56. One um, at RAF Lakenheath in, on the east coast of England. Um, Lakenheath is actually a, a US Air Force controlled airbase and there were various reports of UFOs seen over the runway at Lakenheath and of unusual objects tracked on radar at the base. And 
There are also rumours and stories that several of the pilots managed to film the object using gun cameras. That particular film footage hasn't surfaced into the public domain, but a number of researchers are actively looking for it at the moment to see if we can try and obtain it. Another document classified secret from 1957 um, this concerns an incident off the uh, south coast of England and on an island called the Isle of Wight where two um, jet fighter pilots reported seeing a large circular shaped object flying across the English Channel and across the Isle of Wight. Again this report went up the chain of command to the Ministry of Defence and a team came out, interviewed the pilots, interviewed the radar operators and again the, the typical warning not to talk about this particular incident was put into place and certainly nobody involved in this case did speak out about it until the government decided to release the files. That's one of a number of reports from the early 1960s that the Ministry of Defence have released concerning so-called vehicle interference cases. Some of you might be aware of what I mean by that. For those who aren't, however, throughout the years and throughout the world there have been various reports where people have been driving long roads very often late at night and the headlights on the vehicles have gone out, the engines stalled and the cars just ground to a complete halt. Well, the Ministry of Defence have a number of these reports on file and have investigated them quite extensively. Um, this is just one of a number um, of these particular reports and this one dates from 1962 and in this particular case the witness was driving along a lonely stretch of road uh, late at night, saw a large egg shaped object um, in the road in front of him, his car in this particular case his car didn't actually come to a halt but the acceleration of the vehicle was affected and the headlights were also affected and the Ministry of Defence was sufficiently concerned in this case to send out um, a member of the Royal Air Force Police to investigate the man, sorry, to interview the man and investigate the case. And they also confiscated an official report that the local civil police had put together. So it goes to show that in the UK, like in the US, that certainly it's a case that sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand knows, or there isn't, if you like, blanket access to data on the part of all government agencies, that even within the government there's confiscation of material from one agency to another. This one might be of interest to people who actively investigate the crop circle mystery. Many people, I'm sure, are aware, most of you I'm sure are aware of the, the crop circle mystery and the reports which largely in England date back to the late 1980s or early 1980s I should say, sorry. But this is a report that was filed with the Ministry of Defence in the early 1960s, March 1964 and it was f filed with the Ministry of Defence by um, a priest um, who was based at a place called Penrith which is in the north of England and one of his parishioners had reported a circular form, not a formation um, like the more extensive uh, pictograms uh, that have been reported in more recent years, but a straightforward crop circle which had appeared on farmland in the area. And more significantly, the first uh, paragraph of the man's letter states, does an apparent column of blue light about eight feet in diameter and about 15 feet high, which disappears and leaves a mark of very slightly disturbed earth the same diameter mean anything to you. So in this particular case we've got this circular formation of um, flattened ground on the farmland and we've also got it seen in conjunction with a strange column of blue light in the sky. Now detractors and believers in the crop circle mystery, many of them, will tell you that the the frequency or the history of the subject largely dates back to 1981, 1982, maybe a little bit earlier and there are a few reports that could arguably fit into the crop circle category from centuries ago but certainly this is probably one of the earliest officially recorded reports where we can actually verify that something was seen and was officially investigated. Again, this report went up the chain of the command of the Ministry of Defence and whilst it doesn't necessarily throw light on what crop circles are, it does show that the, the British MOD have had reports on file for almost 40 years that, that could fall into the crop circle category. 
That's a drawing that uh, I just throw in. It was filed with the Ministry of Defence in 1962, and again it was seen an object seen over the north of England. Now, I put that one in there because, to some extent, it looks similar to the um, object that, or the objects that Kenneth Arnold reported, the man who was largely responsible for coining the term flying saucer. And a number of the witnesses in the Roswell crash incident said that the object, in fact, wasn't flying saucer shaped. It was actually more of a heel shape. But that thing was seen, although the report wasn't filed with the Ministry of Defence until 1962, the man who'd seen it had actually made the report, had seen the object, sorry, in 1956. And he'd seen it on a number of occasions. He lived in the wilds of North Yorkshire, which is a, a large moorland area. And he'd seen this thing flying around very quietly, um, no engine sound coming from it. Whether it was a, a genuine UFO or some sort of secret aircraft that was under uh, prototype flight, we're not really sure, but the fact that it's got an undercarriage um, uh, wheel formation might possibly tend to, tend to suggest that this may have been some sort of prototype aircraft that was being test flown. This one you won't be able to see too well, but uh, it's a two-page report. If you can just see it at the top, titled um, Cheshire Constabulary. This is a report from 1966 from a police officer named Colin Perks, who was out on, uh, on duty at the town of Wilmslow. And he'd seen this large green um, oval-shaped object descend into the town, making a low humming noise. and literally 20 or 30 feet behind him. He'd never seen anything like this before and to some extent panicked, uh, filed a report with his headquarters and again uh, the Ministry of Defence were quickly informed because all civil police stations within the UK have a reporting form that in the event that one of their officers should see a UFO, this is who you send the report to. So PC Perks filed his particular reports with his superior officer. It was sent to the Ministry of Defence and in this particular case, again, probably because of the, the credibility and the training of the officer, a team was sent up from the MOD at Whitehall to investigate it. And they travelled out to the scene where the UFO sighting was made and the officer drew a picture which, uh, which, which displays the UFO 30 feet wide and approximately 20 feet high and illuminated by a green glow. And the MOD team went out to the site where this particular thing was seen and lo and behold in the particular area where the thing touched down almost there was an area of fused glass on the ground. Now to this day that particular part of the MOD file hasn't been declassified. We have the police officer's statement attesting to the fact that he saw it and we've also got a document which confirms that one particular div division of the MOD dispatched people to the area to, to find out what had happened. What we don't have, however, is the report put together by the MO MOD agents who looked into the case. And again, of course, that begs the question of why is UFO data um, filed with the MOD and by the MOD being withheld from the public four decades onwards? That's a document, uh, it's the cover page of a NASA paper which I was recently forwarded. Um, the one I actually got hold of was the original document. The reason I put that one in is because it's a NASA paper titled, as you can see, Concepts for Detection of Extraterrestrial Life. And the copy I got hold of was forwarded to the, again, to the British Ministry of Defence. But it was forwarded from there to the AV Row Aircraft Company and specifically to their weapons research division. Now, it's just curious um, that a document, a NASA document dealing with alien life uh, and li alien life forms was forwarded to a weapons division of the Ministry of Defence. And again, it, it gives a good indication of how, in Britain at least, the MOD look at this subject from largely and purely a defensive point of view. This is one of two documents I just want to show you that haven't surfaced under the 30-year ruling, but interestingly enough have been declassified in advance of the 30-year ruling by something called the Civil Aviation Authority. And the Civil Aviation Authority is the, the British equivalent of, the, of your Federal Aviation Authority. 
and these are reports from civil airline pilots either flying over Britain or leaving Britain or entering Britain who um, reported seeing UFOs at close quarters to civil airliners and this is one page of now about 15 or 20 pages that the CIA have declassified concerning UFO reports filed by airline pilots dating back to the late 1970s. That's another one, it's not reproduced too well, but that dates from 1991 and the pilot of an MD-80 aircraft, a Captain Zaghetti, reported seeing a small brown missile type object flying close to his aircraft and interestingly most of the um, incidents involving CIA airliners have been what would be termed near miss incidents to the extent that in one particular case in 1995 when there was a near miss between an airliner and a triangular shaped object over a mountain range in the north of England the flying triangle same came so close to the um, aircraft that the pilots of the aircraft instinctively ducked in the cockpit that shows how close some of these really close encounters are. That's a face some of you might know, that's a man named Nick Pope. Um, Nick works for the Ministry of Defence and he's worked for them since 1985. Between 1991 and 1994 he investigated UFO sightings for one division of the Ministry of Defence called the Secretariat of the Air Staff. Now, Nick is a believer based on his investigations for the MOD that UFOs do exist, that a small percentage are extraterrestrial and he also believes that a small percentage may indicate a defence threat not just to the UK but to the world itself and broadly I agree with Nick's views um, he said he went into the job as an open-minded sceptic, he didn't really know much about the subject and after his three-year tour of duty he came to the conclusion that whilst most sightings can be, exp can be explained rationally there's a small percentage that appears to defy explanation and one particularly notable case that he investigated concerned again a large black flying triangle that was seen over a Royal Air Force base in the county of Shropshire in England uh, called RAF Shawbury and the meteorological officer at the base had reported seeing this vast object about the size of a 747 jumbo jet flying over the base at a height of about 200 feet and at a distance from the base perimeter of only about 200 feet in complete silence and this is one of the key reports that convinced him that whatever UFOs were they certainly weren't um, a case of mistaken identity and he also feels that the, the flying triangle mystery isn't a man-made one shall we say that these aren't prototype aircraft and he based that conclusion largely on the fact that it didn't seem to make sense for the British or the Americans or whoever to be flying um, a prototype object the size of a 747 over the UK where conceivably it could be seen by anyone I mean England itself is only 900 to 1000 miles long and it's heavily populated everywhere so if this was something that, were being, that was a prototype aircraft it, it really didn't make sense to to fly it in an area where it would be seen by one and all but there's one area where I tend to disagree with Nick on and that is the issue of when it comes to official secrecy within the UK and with respect to the UFO subject. Nick believes that when he worked in that particular division of the Ministry of Defence that he got to see all the information that the MOD have on UFOs. Now that is an area where I disagree with him. It's, it's clear from not just my investigations but some of the files which have been released and one or two files which have actually been declassified in error that the office in which Nick worked is in reality only one of about five or six that gets to see UFO reports and that gets to investigate these things. So the idea that he has blankets, 100% access to all the UFO reports that enter the chain of command really doesn't um, hold water and that's something I'll explain to you and go into in more depth shortly. Okay, that broadly is the official story of UFO investigations in Britain from the mid-1940s to the present day. But there's this small office at Whitehall in London which throughout the years has been staffed by various civil servants such as Nick Pope and that there have been a number of interesting radar reports, pilot reports, military and airline pilots 
a number of other interesting encounters such as crop circle reports, police events, um, and that the Ministry of Defence have carefully investigated these things, quietly filed the reports away, and now they're surfacing into the public domain, either on a yearly basis or when the relevant agencies decide to release them. And that probably fits the same scenario that you get to see in the States with the US Air Force, the CIA and the FBI, that certain files are declassified when they reach a certain age or if the security uh, classification has, has reached its expiry date. But again, as in the, U in the UK, sorry, in the US where you have reports of the Roswell incident, Area 51, the so-called Hangar 18, things like that, we have um, a similar situation in the UK where it's been alleged that since about 1943, 1944, a number of incidents occur, have occurred, maybe only four or five, which could broadly fall into the so-called British Roswell scenario. And the case I'd like to begin with is one which largely started with a lady who's on screen now, a face some of you might recognise, a lady named Dorothy Kilgallen. Now, she was an investigative reporter in the US from the 40s through to the 60s, and her main claim to fame was that she was the, the last person to interview Jack Ruby, who was the man who shot Lee Harvey Oswald, who allegedly, of course, was the man who shot President Kennedy. And she, you might wonder what on earth was Dorothy Gil Kilgallen got to do with not just UFOs, but crashed UFOs in particular within the UK. Well, in 1955, Dorothy Kilgallen was holidaying throughout Europe with her husband and spent several days in England and she had a number of quite influential ties and was invited to a cocktail party um, in London, in England's capital, and attending the party were various dignitaries and people from the British Cabinet, the Ministry of Defence, the Government, and somebody quite out of the blue came up to her at this party and began to relate quite an extraordinary story concerning a UFO incident a crash UFO incident that reportedly occurred on the English-Scottish border in 1944. And according to Dorothy Kilgallen's informant, the, the uh, British Army arrived on the scene, found some sort of small crashed UFO with a number of small bodies strewn around it, pretty much like the, the so-called Roswell incident scenario. And According to the information related to her, the British government really didn't know what to do about this case, whether to tell the general public, whether to share this information with the French, the Americans, and finally a decision was taken to contact the, the US and say, look, something's happened, can you shed any light on this incident? And from there, a decision was taken not to inform the public, and it seems to be the case that because the war was raging at the time, that this the information or the, the debris and the bodies were stored away and it was a case of saying well let's win the war first and then providing all's well and we can beat the Germans then we'll take a look at this again because it's obviously nothing to do with them. So Dorothy Kilgallen was, was informed of this particular story and published details in a column that she ran in the Los Angeles Examiner newspaper essentially relating the facts that a UFO had crashed during the Second World War, that bodies had been recovered, and that there was high-level collusion between the Americans and the British on this particular incident. Well, one of the most puzzling aspects of this case that's um, been doing the rounds for a number of years is what on earth would prompt someone from the British government or the British military to simply come up to, of all people, a journalist at a party and relate details of what was presumably one of the British government's most classified secrets of all time. It didn't seem to make sense that somebody would, would open the heart like that and, and risk being identified because presumably the number of people actually in the know would be so small that anyone talking out of turn it would be relatively easy for the Ministry of Defence or the government to identify them and that, that simply didn't make sense and it, it tended to suggest to a lot of people that the story was simply a hoax and, and didn't hold any water. Well when I began writing Cosmic Crashes, my third book, I thought I actually entered the subject of crashed UFOs in, in uh, in England 
not as a believer or as a skeptic, but simply as an open-minded person who simply wanted to unravel this particular mystery. So what I did was to spend a couple of years travelling around the UK, interviewing as many people as possible, following up on pretty much every lead I could, really just to try and find out what the truth was. And one of the things I found out along the way was that Dorothy Kilgallen was the subject of official interest in the US on, both, on the part of both the FBI and the CIA. And both agencies had and still have extensive surveillance files on her. And in the case of the FBI, their, their file on Dorothy Kilgallen runs to about 200 pages in length. And not only does it concern her um, links with the Kennedy assassination, Jack Ruby, Oswald, the Warren Commission, but the file also shows that she also had a number of link, um, contacts who would feed her from time to time information and stories that she would use in her columns uh, covering everything from Soviet spies operating in the US to Israeli intelligence agents trying to obtain US nuclear secrets. So although she, her column was largely based around Hollywood actors and the entertainment uh, business, she also had these good strong contacts which who would feed a story that had a bearing on US national security. And this was one of the reasons why the FBI kept her under watch. Now, with respect to the CIA, at the same time that the FBI were doing this, the CIA were, were doing this, um, carrying out a similar operation, and neither party knew that the other one was, was, uh, was keeping watch on her. Well, again, the CIA realized that Dorothy Kilgallen had all these good, strong contacts and formulated officially, this has now been um, verified by the files which have been released, formulated a plan uh, which essentially said that Dorothy Kilgallen has all this information that conceivably could help US national security. How can we um, get her to share some of this information with us? And so the CIA put this plan together where they said if she would help them with a few of her contacts, then they would feed her a few snippets of stories from their files, which she could use as scoops in her newspaper column. And this plan to share information from the CIA's own files was made literally only weeks before she was fed this particular crashed UFO story. So when you consider that she was actually, a plan was put in place to share data from the CIA's own records, it actually makes it more conceivable rather than less conceivable that she would be given these fantastic details of a crashed UFO incident. So that is the situation with respect to Dorothy Kilgallen's involvement in this wartime British Roswell. But the story gets even stranger with regard to the lady on the right in that photo, which is a little bit out of focus, but never mind. Who is, of course, the late actress Marilyn Monroe. Um, you may again wonder what on earth does Marilyn Monroe have to do with not just UFOs but crashed UFOs and, and government conspiracies on that particular subject. Well, a few years ago, I think 1995, a document surfaced by a private investigator named Milo Spiriglio. And Spiriglio had written a number of books about the death of Marilyn Monroe which made a, a very convincing argument that it wasn't simply a straightforward suicide. And again, like the Kennedy assassination, all sorts of theories have been put forward as to how Marilyn Monroe died and if she was murdered and, and by whom. Well, Spiriglio obtained a copy of a document, which is a CIA document, and it's the cover page of a document concerning a wiretap, um, phone tap, um, of Marilyn Monroe's home by the CIA. And the document that Spiriglio received was a summary of a lengthy conversation between Marilyn Monroe and a man named Howard Rothberg, who was a, a joint associate of both Monroe and, and Kilgallen. And according to the documents, uh, and, and again, it's, it's now verified, of course, that uh, Marilyn Monroe had affairs with both John F. Kennedy and Robert F. Kennedy. And the document refers to information related to Marilyn Monroe by John F. Kennedy on various subjects such as plans to assassinate Fidel Castro and invade Cuba 
but it also refers to how President Kennedy informed Marilyn Monroe that when he became president, he was taken to quote to quote the document a secret airbase and shown a crashed spacecraft and bodies from outer space. It doesn't have any reference to Roswell or Area 51. It just refers to a crashed spacecraft and dead bodies from outer space. So. Pretty controversial document. A number of ex-CIA people have looked at it and have confirmed that the typeface used in the documents does match the sort of typewriters used by the CIA in the early 1960s. And there are a number of internal references which CIA personnel have said, yes, it does match the, the phraseology, if you like, of, of CIA personnel. Now, again, Marilyn Monroe was the subject of both CIA and FBI surveillance. And again, their files have been declassified into the public domain on Marilyn Monroe. At least as far as the FBI is concerned, I think most of their papers have now been declassified, but certainly the CIA, there are strong indications that they're withholding a lot more. Now, people say, what on earth are the, are the prime reasons for withholding UFO data from the general public? And if um, we look at this particular case in more depth, we find that the, the document itself was dated only two days before Marilyn Monroe was found dead under circumstances which of course still provoke controversy to this day. Now, according to the documents, because of the way she'd been treated by the Kennedys, Marilyn Monroe threatened, quote, to tell all that she knew, not just about plans to invade Cuba and kill Fidel Castro, but also about this crashed UFO incident. And it's a matter of record that Marilyn Monroe did have something that she called her Diary of Secrets, where she would report quite extensively all the information related to her by the Kennedys. And this, doc this particular document went missing shortly after she died, and the diary hasn't surfaced, si surfaced since. Now, with respect to this particular report itself, it states that, her, that she threatened to tell all and hold a press conference, and 48 hours later she was found dead. So, again, it begs the question, to what extent will people within the military or within the government or within some hidden department somewhere, to what extent will they go really to keep this information under wraps? And I think that when you look at the issue of conspiracy and cover-up, not just in the UK but elsewhere, the US, around the world, I think that part of the secrecy relating to the subject centers not around UFOs themselves, but what may have been done, quote, in the name of national security to hide the information. But information on this particular crashed UFO case from the Second World War continues to come forward. And just recently, um, at the Public Record Office, a whole batch of files have been declassified on something called the Foo Fighter mystery. And the Foo Fighters, for those who aren't aware of it, were small balls of light, anything from six inches to two, three, four, five feet diameter objects that were seen throughout Europe and the Far East during the Second World War by both Allied and Axis pilots. And the Germans thought they were an experimental aircraft of the Allies. The Allies thought they were an experimental um, device of the Germans and so on. Well, just recently, a batch of papers have been declassified, not just concerning Foo Fighters, but also of huge cigar-shaped objects uh, seen over Europe by Royal Air Force pilots uh, taking part in bombing missions over Germany. And a number of these files uh, were recently found by a man named Andy Roberts, a British UFO investigator. And Andy's quite a hard-nosed sceptic, but even he admits to being baffled by these particular reports and the fact that they come from such credible sources. But although these particular reports, I should, I should stress, don't relate to this particular crash case, they do confirm that in precisely the time frame when this incident reportedly occurred, that UFOs, Foo Fighters and huge structured objects were being seen by Royal Air Force personnel, not just over Europe, but also over the UK. That's a man I'm sure a lot of you will recognise, Bob Dean. Bob uh, worked with NATO in the early 1960s and has talked about something that he calls the assessment, a lengthy document concerning a NATO evaluation of UFO encounters, abductions, contactee cases, radar reports, pilot reports, really across the board, scientific data, everything. 
and according to Bob this particular assessment document was classified at a very high level and wasn't seen really outside of the high levels of NATO. But one of the entries that Bob talks about in the files concerns a crashed UFO incident at a place called Timmonsdorfer on the Russian border. And why this particular case is of relevance to what I wanted to talk to you about this evening is because, according to Bob, the team of military personnel that arrived on the scene to retrieve this particular object were attached to the British Army and from one particular unit known as the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers, or the REMI for short, as they're known. And according to Bob, this object was trapped uh, malfunctioning or flying erratically in the atmosphere and in the skies over Europe by the Russians, the Americans and the British. And there was a mad scramble on everybody's part to get there and the British arrived first. And according to Bob, the team that uh, coordinated the retrieval seemed to have some sort of prior knowledge of what this object was or how it flew uh, to the extent that when they arrived at the scene and secured it, they said that the object could be taken apart almost like a Chinese puzzle in that you would remove one part of it and then another part would be would, would come loose which could be retrieved and taken apart and it was almost a case of storing piece by piece on top of each other like crates and according to Bob the um, object contained 12 small bodies of a so-called grey type of alien all identical in appearance and physiology and Bob said that various autopsies were undertaken of some of the bodies and the rest were put into uh, cryogenic storage if you like. Well, with this particular case being a, a strong one, what I did was to um, track down people attached to the Remy at the time and at the present day and say, look, this guy's spoken out about this particular incident, do you know anything about it? And various people confirmed that they did. Um, one of the most notable being a man who, when Bob surfaced, he was still employed by the Remy and approached his superior officer and said, although I wasn't, wasn't involved in this case as my superior, do you know anything about it? And he came back to him a couple of days later and essentially scared the, the hell out of him and told him not to talk about it, to leave it well alone. And again, there was the, the typical um, warning that if he wanted to hang on to his military pension, he would drop the matter. Which is, which is what he did. He was willing to admit to me that he'd spoken to his superior and what the response was, but then he said, look, I don't want to take it any further. But certainly that was an indication that this particular incident was a valid one and that it did have a basis in fact. That's a location called RF Cosford, which um, is located in the middle of England about 150 miles north of London. And RAF Cosford was the site in December 1963 of one of the more significant UFO incidents in investigated by the British MOD. And that isn't the exact location at Cosford where the event occurred, but what happened was that an object, a UFO, whatever you want to call it, was seen hovering near a hangar at the base and it came down in front of the hangar and landed on a concrete forecourt very much like that one. Now the, the hangar in question has, has long been knocked down, um, dismantled I think about 25 years ago, but that is broadly what the, um, the location looked like, so I just put that up there as a good indication for you. But the case itself may be a landing case, it may be a crash retrieval, it may have been some sort of crash landing then the object exited the area, we really don't know. But what we do know for certain is that on the night of December 11, 1963, a number of RAF personnel at the base reported seeing an object, an egg-shaped object, flying towards the base, near the, towards the hangar, lowered down and landed right in front of it. And either shortly before or shortly after, we're not sure again, the object was also seen near the runway and on the following day burn marks or scorch marks were found which were an indication to those involved that maybe this thing had either landed or malfunctioned and, and smashed onto the runway. Well, this case is significant because in 1995 the Ministry of Defence declassified a file 
on the incident and it's the most extensive file declassified by the MOD on one particular UFO incident and it runs to just under 100 pages in length and there are rumours that the file itself is only one of about five or six which, exi which exist on this case and that the file that's been declassified is the one that's been seen fit for public consumption, shall we say. And the file itself is a, a correspondence file between members of the public with an interest in UFOs and the MOD. Because of, there were so many people involved in this case, inevitably at the time the story leaked out, not just to the public but to the media as well. And soon there were people from not just UFO magazines but the national press contacting RAF Cosford saying, look, we've heard about this incident from personnel on the base. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, the MOD played a curious game with this case and denied that anything unusual had happened. But an examination of the file shows that for some reason, over the course of no more than a matter of weeks, the MOD actually put out a, ver a complete contradiction of statements to try and play down the incident. First they said it was a case of mistaken identity, then it was a hoax, then it was high spirits, which didn't really explain anything. And the most bizarre explanation of all was that the MOD said that trained um, MOD and RAF personnel had mistaken the UFO for a, um, a steam train which was uh, going along a nearby track at the time of the incident. Now, of course, the idea that trained Ministry of Defence and Royal Air Force personnel could mistake a, a green, brightly lit UFO hovering over an aircraft hangar for a, a fairly ancient and decrepit steam train trundling along a, a nearby track, sort of beggar's belief, but nevertheless that's what the MOD would have people believe and of course if uh, it goes without saying that if RAF personnel can't tell the difference between uh, a UFO in the sky and a steam train then uh, Britain's defence is in a pretty uh, poor state. <laughs> I mean it's not in a marvellous state anyway but uh, that would just make it worse still. So um, that was the, the uh, in essence, that is the file. It's a, a correspondence file between the general public and the MOD, and the MOD steadfastly stuck to their guns that, that no, nothing untoward occurred. But again, people are still coming forward who report who remembered seeing the burn marks or where this thing had crash landed on the runway, or they recall being silenced. And one of the most interesting witnesses to this case who saw the thing at, at very close quarters where he could even see uh, markings on the side of the object had a sort of a, a curious encounter shortly afterwards when he was posted to a nearby, sorry, posted to another base and underwent some sort of almost like a mind control scenario and the events were almost erased if you like from his memory for a number of years and it wasn't until the late 1980s that his recollection of this event began to come back to him and he remembered what occurred and how, how he was investigated and interrogated by the MOD and the Royal Air Force at the time and how studies were undertaken into what this thing may have been and it's a curious case because it involves all sorts of intrigue and even reports of men in black type figures um, keeping watch, of him, watch on him 25, 30 years later. So whatever occurred in this particular incident, it's quite clear that the file or the one file that's been released is only one of a number and we're really just getting to see the tip of the iceberg. That's um, the Berwyn Mountains in North Wales in England. And the Berwyn Mountains was the site of what has arguably become uh, known as, as the definitive British Roswell. Um, on the night of January the 23rd, 1974, some sort of unusual event occurred on the Berwyn Mountains. Nobody to this day exactly knows what and even amongst the UFO research community there's a lot of disagreement as to what may have taken place but essentially what happened was that on the range of mountains um, that you can see in the uh, at the rear of the picture um, some sort of object or vehicle crashed onto the mountainside there was a report of um, a ground shake almost like an earthquake Villagers in the area reported seeing strange lights in the sky, windows shattered, pictures and paintings fell off walls, um, 
cups and saucers fell off tables, you name it, just like a, a mini earthquake. That's another photograph of the area, just to give you an indication of, of what the place on the area looks like. And it's certainly not a, a heavily populated area, it's quite remote, so if anything did occur on the Burwin Mountains, then it would be quite easy and simple for the authorities to keep the information under wraps. But the events of January the 23rd, 74, were only the culmination of a series of, in some ways, even more curious events that began in September 1973. And from September 73 through to the, the very night that this incident occurred, there were reports throughout Britain of something that became known as the Phantom Helicopter. And people throughout Staffordshire, Shropshire, Cheshire and through to North Wales where this incident occurred, which are all sort of broadly in the centre of, of Britain, reported seeing black, dark helicopters, unmarked helicopters flying around the skies either late at night or in the early hours of the morning. And nobody seemed to know what these things were or who they belonged to. Checks were made with the Royal Air Force and they didn't seem to belong to them. The Army denied any knowledge of them. They didn't seem to be related to uh, the activities of commercial companies. Theories were put forward that it was the IRA bringing in terrorists or maybe somebody else bringing in illegal immigrants. And just recently, one particular division of the British Police, an intelligence division called Special Branch, has declassified several files on this case which concern the helicopter encounters. And again, it shows that even to the, the people within Special Branch, they didn't seem to know who was responsible for these particular cases. So we have this scenario where something unusual was occurring throughout the country in the build-up to this event. And it all culminated on the, on the night of January the 23rd, 1974. That's a lady who, up until round about 1996, probably carried out the most extensive investigation of this case. That's a lady named Margaret Fry. And Margaret interviewed various witnesses who reported seeing a large egg-shaped object on the mountain, of seeing British Army troops um, running around the mountainside, keeping people away of small balls of light dancing around the hillsides, of people warned not to talk about this particular incident, military personnel fearful almost in some cases of their lives 25, 30 years on. And Margaret is, is largely convinced that something of a, of a UFO nature did occur on the Berwyn Mountains at the time in question. And that's Ma uh, Margaret out at the location itself pointing across to where all this occurred. So as you can see, it, it is pretty much remote. Now, that's a man who I mentioned earlier, Andy Roberts, who recently found the newly declassified Foo Fighter reports at the Public Record Office. Andy isn't really a, a believer in the idea of that UFOs represent some sort of ET presence, but even Andy admits that this particular case, which he's looked into quite extensively, is one of the more interesting that have occurred and although he feels that the incident can be resolved by way of a curious combination of earthquakes and meteor strikes, even Andy feels that there are questions to be resolved that there haven't been resolved. Now uh, that's the B4391 road that runs at the foot of the Berwyn Mountains and which plays quite an important role in the case as I'll explain to you now. That's just another shot of it. And it all centres around the B4391 and this place, which is Porton, the entrance to a place called Porton Down. Now, Porton Down is the British government's chemical and biological defence and offensive research establishment in Wiltshire. And in 1996, a man came forward named James Prescott, who formerly served with the British Army. And Prescott stated that on the night of January the 23rd, 74, he was part of a team that was sent up from the south of England for what he initially believed was to be some sort of military training exercise. And they were told to head towards the North Wales location where this incident occurred. And right up until the night in question, when all hell broke loose, he was still convinced, or the team was convinced, that this was still going to be some sort of military exercise. Well, 
According to Prescott, when they got to the mountainside, there were troops all over the area, up and down the mountains, military helicopters flying all over the place, and his team was told to stand at the foot of the Berwins, just in a small lay-by like that, and they had travelled up there in three or four military lorries, and they were told that somebody would be coming down the mountain very, very shortly, and that they should secure the material evidence that the people would be bringing down with them, and that they should transfer it to Porton Down. Well, of course at the time, none of the personnel involved knew precisely what was going on, but uh, a team of about five or six people came down from the mountain carrying two crates between them. They loaded the crates onto the lorries and were told, get down to Port and Down. The crates are to be opened in one particular room in your presence and you're not to leave the side of these crates at any time. Well, they travelled down the, um, the motorway to Port and Down, were ushered into one particular building at the facility and the crates were opened in their presence and according to James Prescott they contained two five foot emaciated bodies which looked slightly human but were understandably not human. Whatever they were they appeared to be in some way related to the human species but it was quite clear that they weren't human beings and according to James Prescott he'd never seen anything like this in his life before or, before or since and it changed his, out, his whole outlook on the world if you like. Well, when Prescott spoke out he was the only one actually talking about um, the port and down link with this particular incident. But since then, several other people have come forward, Royal Air Force and Army personnel, confirming that they heard the same story or were involved in this particular incident. Uh, some cases recalled it from the time, obviously. Other people were informed whilst in the service in 79 80. For some reason, the story was doing the rounds within the military at the time, and people were talking to colleagues. Do you know what's, her, what's occurred? Have you heard this story? And th there's no doubt, I don't think now, that something of a UFO nature did occur and that it did in some way involve Port and Down. Now, Port and Down itself is significant in, in the sense that where it's located is literally on the doorstep of where, for years, numerous crop circles and pictogram formations have been seen. And crop circles have actually appeared on land that Port and Down owns. Now, the area itself is, is practically impenetrable, so it's interesting that these extensive formations have, have been seen in, the air, in areas where largely the general public has no access at all. Now, that's the entrance to a place called Boscombe Down. Boscombe Down is literally a stone's throw away from Port and Down, and it's where the British government test flies um, all its new and experimental aircraft from. And there are rumours that the British military has its own version of the American stealth bomber and the stealth fighter that is undergoing um, test flights, shall we say. Now, this particular object is rumoured to be much smaller than the stealth fighter, maybe 10 to 12 feet long, and that it's simply some sort of remotely piloted thing. So, whatever this particular object is, um, it seems to be the case that it's from Boscombe Down where it's test flown and various people living in the area have reported seeing this thing taking off and landing in the early hours of the morning and in September 1994 some sort of unusual object crash landed on the runway at Boscombe Down. Now almost certainly this was one of these prototype stealth aircraft and, and not a UFO but the reason why I refer to it is because the military moved in swiftly retrieved the object and largely kept the story under wraps and prevented any sort of media attention. So this incident serves to, to show that in the UK as in the US that radical and new aircraft or exotic aircraft ca can crash to earth and the military has set procedures in place to, to deal with the uh, removal and containment not just of the object but of the story as well. So I just throw that in to show that if an, in, an incident occurred within the UK, either UFO related or prototype aircraft related, that provisions are there to deal with it immediately. But just to show that there are other things going on at Boscombe Down as well, that's a lady named Rita Hill. Now, Rita um, served with the Royal Air Force between 1949 and 1951 
and she served as a medic at Boscombe Down. And she had the fairly grisly task of when um, prototype aircraft were being flown from the base, um, as they often did being prototype aircraft, they would crash, and she had the grisly task of having to go out and help recover the bodies of the pilots. But she said that very often when prototype aircraft were being flown from Boscombe and were flying high over the UK, very often the pilots would report seeing um, fast-moving flying saucers, UFOs, etc. And again, nobody seemed to know what these things were. Reports went up the chain of command of the Ministry of Defence and personnel were sent out to Boscombe Down to... Uh, debrief everybody involved in the incidents and again everybody was sworn to secrecy and again it's an indication that whatever was going on at Boscombe Down in terms of flying test aircraft for some reason those pilots in the UFOs seem to have an awareness of when particularly new and radical aircraft were being test flown for example Rita was was keen to point out that when standard aircraft that have been flown for years um, were being flown over the UK, pilots wouldn't report these things as frequently as when, for example, they were flying some sort of aircraft with a new radical radar system on board or when they were test flying new missiles. Uh, it was these precise times and events when um, the UFOs were seen with more frequency. That's just a picture of Rita again, conf just to show we can confirm that she is the person who she claims to be, that she did hold the official position that she claims to have held at Boscombe Down, that's her outside the station sit quarters. That's a place called Government Communications Headquarters, which is the British equivalent of the American National Security Agency. And that's about as close as you can get to GCHQ's main headquarters without getting arrested on site. Um, now, GCHQ, largely their involvement in the UFO subject is something that hasn't really been discussed to a great extent until a couple of years ago when a man named Robin Cole sort of made it his job almost, if you like, to try and resolve the issue of what GCHQ knew about UFOs and knows about the subject to this day. And Robin's interest largely stemmed from a series of incidents that occurred in the latter part of 1996 when a series of curious events occurred over the UK, the various um, multiple radar visual events involving the Royal Air Force and Civilian, Air Force, Civilian um, Aviation Authority over the UK, on the night of October the 3rd, 1996, um, various UFOs were seen over the North Sea, also by the crew of um, a number of oil tankers. And shortly afterwards, um, some sort of object impacted off the east coast of Scotland. Again, we have no idea, at least in the public domain, as to what this object was, but it's curious that only two days after this impact occurred, a large NATO exercise was put into place in the area. And there are rumours that the Royal Air Force retrieved some sort of object from the North Sea. Now, again, people have said, well, maybe it was some sort of prototype aircraft, but when we consider that it occurred only literally hours after this series of multiple radar visual UFO events, then it just tends to suggest otherwise. But Robin uh, Cole found out that shortly after this incident occurred, that a high-level investigation was put into place by GCHQ to try and resolve what occurred. And Robin's investigations really opened a, a hornet's nest um, which showed that not only was GCHQ investigating UFOs, but it was also investigating Robin and keeping him under surveillance. And he prepared a detailed report all about this particular case and what he found out about it. But one of the, thing, one of the most curious aspects of this case was the way in which GCHQ put Robin himself under surveillance and, this, and why specifically they did it. And what we found is that Robin wrote this particular report on the case um, concerning his investigations and forwarded a copy to GCHQ for comments, who understandably declined to comment. But when he did so, um, only two days later, um, a strange van appeared outside his window of his flat, his apartment, and I suppose like most people, he tend to recognise the vehicles that uh, are situated outside your own home. 
and this the van seemed to have sort of a, a curious raised circular roof section to it. Um, it appeared several times outside his window and on the final occasion, this was late at night, early hours of the morning, he went outside, tried to get the license plate only for the thing to speed away. Eventually he managed to get hold of it and contacted um, a friend of mine and Robbins who formerly served with the British Police Force and asked if a, a check could be made on the license plate of the van. Now I know in, in America you can pay a small fee and if you um, if you want to track down someone by their license plate. But in England, it's actually against the law to try and obtain somebody's name and address via their uh, vehicle registration. But naturally, the police force, of course, have full and accurate details of all license plates. And this mutual friend of myself and Robin, um, who was formerly attached to the police, made inquiries. And it was found that the, the van itself was registered to the British Ministry of Defence, and specifically an MOD location in Wiltshire which of course is precisely where Porton Down, Boscombe Down and the, the crop circles are seen with regularity. Um, from there things got even weirder when it was found that not only um, was GCHQ keeping an eye on Robin but we, from there we found that the van itself was registered to a particular MOD post box and the ownership of the post box couldn't be resolved. This was something that seem to be completely out of bounds. Now, why that should be the case, we don't know, but it shows that there was GCHQ involved in surveillance of Robin, the Ministry of Defence and the Royal Air Force. Now, when all this became, not so much a matter of um, public knowledge, but when people began to realise that there was something to the GCHQ link, Robin was contacted by a local TV station and asked to appear on TV to talk about what he'd found out and about his investigations into the UFO mystery. The following day after the programme was broadcast, Robin received a telephone call from um, a Detective Inspector Tim Camp, sorry, Detective Sergeant Tim Camp of Cheltenham Police Force and essentially uh, the conversation went, Mr Cole, my name is Detective Sergeant Tim Camp of Cheltenham Police, can I come and interview you with regard to your interest in GCHQ? And Robin said, well why would you want to interview me? And he said, well we've just got a couple of questions for you. When, when would you like to do the interview? Can we come now? And this was about 8am 8, 8 on, a, on a Wednesday morning, something like that. Well, Robin said okay and set the interview up. Two police officers came round, Detective Sergeant Camp and one other guy, and Robin fortunately had the presence of mind to set a small tape recorder up in his house and to tape the entire conversation between himself and the police officers. Well, they started asking questions not just about his interest in GCHQ, but in what they termed the phenomenon, the phenomena, flying saucers, UFOs, why he was interested, why he was trying to make a link between the UFO subjects and GCHQ, or why he was investigating this particular link. And he answered a number of questions, one of which centred around, around a man named Matthew Williams. Now, has anybody in the room heard of Matthew Williams? If I tell you who he is, then you might, you might recognise the name. Matthew was arrested and charged last year. He was the first person actually charged and prosecuted for making a crop circle. And the story of what he did actually made the rounds within the UFO um, media widely. And Matthew wasn't strictly charged with making a crop circle. He was charged with damage to a crop. And the police officers from Cheltenham asked a number of questions about Matthew and his activities at a place called RAF Rudlow Manor, which is somewhere I'll come into shortly. Um, well, the interview came to a halt. The officers from the uh, police left, and Robin was sort of left perturbed, wondering why on earth are Cheltenham police interviewing me, investigating me for my interest in UFOs, GCHQ, and why on earth are they asking questions about Matthew Williams? Why have I got vans outside the house? Why are they being traced back to a Ministry of Defence post box which we can't track down and which even the police can't track down? Again, none of it seemed to make any sense. Well, the following day from that, Robin decided to phone Cheltenham Police and try and get to the bottom of this mystery himself and asked to be put through to Detective Sergeant Tim Camp and the response was, well, we don't have a Detective Sergeant Tim Camp. 
various checks were made and it was found that Detective Sergeant Camp wasn't just attached to Cheltenham Police, he was, atta he was attached to Cheltenham Special Branch, which is an elite division of the uh, British Police Force. So again, here we have a, a direct link between some sort of incident involving an unknown object which impacted off the northeast coast of England. We've got high level complicity on the part of GCHQ, the police and the Royal Air Force, all simply because Robin Cole decided to try and resolve this particular mystery. Now, when I mention Matthew Williams and Rudlow Manor, That's RAF Rudlow Manor. I'll go back to the slide shortly, but Rudlow Manor, again, is literally only a matter of miles away from Porton Down and Boscombe Down. And on the surface, it just looks like a picturesque Royal Air Force base in sunny England. That's uh, one particular fo aerial photograph of it taken by Matthew. And as you can see, barracks there and a bunker-like uh, building on the bottom right. And that's another aerial photograph of the manor house itself. It's called RAF Rudlow Manor because it's built on the site uh, of an ancient manor house that dates back many centuries. Now, the base itself, as I said, just looks like a picture picturesque RAF station in the middle of a woodland and, and field area. But it's built on the site, and now by the, the staff's own admission, the site of an underground base which is the size of 12 full-size football pitches and which extends underground uh, for five to six hundred feet. Now, people have said, well, surely it wouldn't be possible to build something like that and not have anybody know about it. But in actual fact, everybody does know about it because nearby is a city, the city of Bath. And Bath is distinctive because the entire city is built out of one particular type of stone. And the stone itself was quarried from the area where Rudlow Manor now exists. And during the Second World War, um, the Ministry of Defence realised with, with all these quarried out tunnels and caverns that it would be a good place for munition storage and then with the advent of atomic weapons it was decided that in the event of a nuclear attack deep caverns buried five to six hundred feet underground this would be a, the ideal location uh, for some sort of continuation of government but Matthew Williams um, investigations have shown that Rudlow Manor in addition to potentially acting as a, a location for emergency planning in the event of a nuclear attack. There's also been rumours and stories linking um, one particular division at Rudlow called the Provost and Security Services with secret UFO investigations. And like Area 51, like the legends of things such as Hangar 18, various military personnel have come forward to say that when the so-called British Roswells have occurred, that it's to Rudlow Manor that the debris and the bodies have been uh, transferred. And various um, Ministry of Defence and military people within the UK have stated that they've seen bodies frozen or cryogenically stored deep under RAF Rudlow Manor. And as I mentioned, there's no disputing the fact that these caverns and tunnels and these huge underground installations deep, in up, deep uh, below Rudlow Manor exist. That's a fact and one or two of them you can actually now go into, they have um, tours of the area but you can go so far and then you reach the large military um, vaulted door, shall we say, huge thick metal door, something like this, which extend 15, 20 feet high and you can then go no further. Um, Matthew and a colleague managed to break in there once and got into one of the bases, managed to take a number of photographs showing that they are still widely in, in use on the part of the military. Now. I mentioned that the, the team of personnel that it's long been rumoured carry out the elite UFO investigations at Rudlow is called the Provost and Security Services and that is um, one page from the Provost and Security Services internal manual um, which was leaked by um, an employee at the base a number of years ago and it goes into detail about the sort of work that PNSS personnel um, undertake involving everything from um, counterintelligence operations, spying on the Russians or the Chinese uh, or Saddam Hussein and so on. Um, now, 
The rumours that Matthew and a number of other people uncovered concerning the involvement of the Provost and Security Services in UFO investigations um, for a number of years remained at rumour level and nothing really of any substance um, came from the investigations. However, a couple of years ago at the Public Record Office a document surfaced that confirmed the involvement of Rudlow Manor in UFO studies dating back to at least 1962 and almost certainly this document was declassified in error. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that when documents are released um, by the government's 30-year ruling, that um, they appear on the shelves at the Public Record Office and anyone can go down and look at them. But purely because of the, the huge volume of files that are now surfacing, not just on UFOs, but on all sorts of subjects, sometimes material leaks through the cracks, shall we say, and files that shouldn't be declassified simply are released into the public domain because there's, there's so many files to be looked at and so few personnel who have the capability to know what should be released and what shouldn't. Well, this particular document that dated from 1962 showed that the Provost and Security Services from Rudlow have been carrying out investigations since that time and the file itself concerned the sighting of a strange globe-like object which was seen over a, a hillside uh, near an ancient fort um, in the south of England and a couple of years ago I managed to track down the lady who'd filed the report and she said that, yes, she filed this report with the local Air Force base and shortly afterwards somebody came out to interview her. And I said, well, can you explain what happened? She said, well, there was a knock at the door. I opened the door and there was this guy stood there in a black suit, black tie, with a black car outside, came in the house, interviewed me, confiscated the photographs I'd taken of the object and told me not to talk about what had occurred. Now, of course, that sounds like a typical man in black type story. And, of course, in many of these cases, although the witnesses are 100% genuine, we don't have any form of documentation to try and find out who these people were. But in this particular case, we had the document that surfaced at the PRO confirming that it, it was an agent from the Provost and Security Services at Rudlow. Now, shortly after this document surfaced, I mentioned it on a BBC TV show, and Matthew and a number of other colleagues went down to the PRO to have a look at it, and it had vanished. Uh, it wasn't there on the shelves, it wasn't on open inspection, even the staff at the PRO said they didn't know where it was. We got a sort of a, a guarded response shortly afterwards from a certain person at the PRO that the file had been withdrawn by the Ministry of Defence, and when questions were raised as, well, why has it been withdrawn? The answer came back that it was withdrawn because there was something in the file that really uh, warranted it remaining classified. Now, the only thing of any significance contained within this file was this particular report identifying Rudlow Manor as a, an investigative uh, post, if you like, for UFO reports. Now, in the UK at least, this tends to suggest that the men in black are a, a real genuine mystery and that their point of origin is RAF Rudlow Manor. Now just in closing, if UFOs have crashed and Rudlow Manor is their ultimate location, people have said, well, how on earth can this sort of material, this sort of information be contained from the general public and the media at large? And one possible indication comes by a couple of letters which I'll just refer you to. Um, these are letters from the Ministry of Defence written to an elected member of the British Parliament, which is similar to your US Senate, uh, a man named Martin Redmond. Martin Redmond had a personal interest in the UFO subject and raised issues, raised questions within Parliament, asking, for example, how many UFO reports were investigated per year by the Ministry of Defence, by GCHQ, by certain intelligence divisions within the MOD, and he got a number of curious responses. This one from the Honourable Nicholas Soames MP, who was formerly attached to the um, Ministry of Defence of the British Government. And what this particular letter shows, and this particular letter too, is that Martin Redmond, as an elected MP of the British Government, was refused access not just to UFO data, but 
the Ministry of Defence refused to inform him how many times and on how many occasions MI6 and GCHQ had investigated UFOs and how many reports they had on file. So if, for example, members of the general public um, don't have access to um, UFO data, then you would at least think that members of the British government would be. However, this, these two particular letters, which were released to me a couple of years ago, show that even people within governments aren't allowed access to the most guarded UFO secrets, shall we say. Now, without getting too conspiratorial, I'm sure many of you will know that with regard to the Roswell incident, that questions were tabled by the Republican congressman or senator, I'm not sure, Stephen Schiff, who later died of cancer. Um, Martin Redmond raised the same questions in the British Parliament, shortly afterwards died of cancer. Uh, maybe coincidental, it may not be, but certainly a number of people have been quite vocal about the fact that, in their opinion, it isn't coincidental, but I simply throw that in um, really to point out to you that um, even within the UK, which is a fairly conservative country, shall we say, that um, there are a lot of very, very dark rumours going around about what's been done in the name of national security to keep this information under wraps. So I think we're going to have about a 20 minute, half an hour question and answer session, but I hope I've gone some way to briefing you on not just the official story concerning the British government's involvement in the UFO subject, but also the unofficial story of four or five so-called British Roswells. And if anybody's got any questions about either the lecture or just questions in general, just let me know and I'll be uh, happy to answer them. Thanks. I saw one of your uh, previous lectures at another event, I can't remember exactly what, but um, you mentioned something about a retrovirus being obtained via ET's uh -huh. bodies. Um, but you didn't go into very much detail about that, and I'm a little confused. Uh, it sounded as if you were in c implying that the um, ET's had a virus. Um, well, this. This centers around a document that was um, one of the new Majestic 12 documents that was received by Tim Cooper and um, that's currently been investigated by Robert and Ryan Wood. And the document refers to how, when the bodies were supposedly recovered at Roswell, that a number of the technicians involved in the recovery contracted some sort of virus and died very, very quickly. And that it was determined that the bodies themselves, or the blood or the, the, the DNA, contained some sort of virus that was lethal to people. Not a deliberately created virus created by aliens, but simply something within their bodies that uh, was lethal to people. And that a determination was made that this could somehow be used as a, as a biological weapon, if you like. And it refers to studies undertaken by the British and the American governments. Now, it's just curious that this story surfaced at the same time that these British Army people have come forward saying that alien bodies were taken to Port and Down, which in Britain is exactly where something like that would be undertaken from, precisely where biological research is undertaken into viruses and uh, biological warfare. So it's just curious that it all happened at the same time. So whether someone was trying to get a story out and, and release details, we just don't know, but um, if, there's, if there's a truth to the story, then, then in Britain, Port and Down would be the location. And again, the fact that these British Army people have surfaced saying that, yes, this is where it all occurred, and we can verify their credentials, tends to suggest, you know, the story isn't one to, to be dismissed. Thank you. Okay. I, I just have a few questions mm -hmm. about um, the nature of the evidence for two of the latest mm -hmm. uh, crash retrieval, possible crash retrieval cases that you talked about. And the one that occurred on December 11th, 1963, uh -huh. um, you said that there was a Ministry of Defense document that was declassified yeah. on that. But it didn't actually confirm that it was a UFO incident, I suspect. Oh, no, this, this is the file, as I say, that's the correspondence file between the general public and, and the Ministry of Defence, people asking questions about it. it. It talks about what the people saw, and it, it's 
quite openly talks about how they reported seeing this object come down near the hangar and that it cast a, a green light over the area and that there was a all the people were interviewed, etc. But the Ministry of Defence's stance in the file is that none of that happened. But it's all referenced in the, the allegations are referenced, but they just said no, it, it didn't occur. In the same way, you know, there's say a file on the Roswell, the the, um, the Air Force's report on Roswell goes into all the allegations, but then they simply say no, it was a balloon. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's like that. Mm -hmm. Now, in the other incident on January 23rd, 1974, mm -hmm. in the Berwyn Mountains uh -huh. in North Wales. Um, you had one witness who came forward, came forward under his own name, James mm -hmm. Prescott, who said he saw yeah. the two bodies, uh -huh. two alien bodies. But what other evidence and, and witnesses are there on that incident? Um, there's other military personnel who've come forward um, who, haven't, who didn't see the bodies but confirmed the story about being transferred to Port and Down, that they were aware of that at the time, that whatever these bodies were, they were taken there from a particular location on the North Wales Mountains. Now, in addition to that, we've got civilian people in the area from a local village called Landrillo, um, with, who reported seeing not just strange lights on the mountains, but quite openly recalled the, the ground shake and these objects streaking across the hillside and then impacting, who also reported seeing police cordons and army cordons and recall, recalled in some cases personally being turned away from the area by the military. Now, this story, although the UFO angle, even I would be uh, quite happy to, to admit, hasn't been confirmed, this, the story about something occurring on the Bowie Mountains was reported widely in the press at the time, and it was in the, the London Times newspapers and the Guardian, the, da the Daily Telegraph, and all the North Wales newspapers also reported um, that something had occurred. Did so, they report it as a possible UFO or just some no, anomaly? At the, no, at the time it was there was a ground shake, something unusual was seen in the sky, the Ministry of Defence and the RAF were investigating, and then several days later the story died down because they said they didn't find anything. And the story literally then remained buried until this trickle of military people and members of the public in the area then began to come forward saying, um, you know, we recalled this incident a number of years ago and uh, we thought you might like to know about it. Or a number of UFO researchers simply latched onto it because they remembered it at the time and then began to look into it uh, retrospectively, so to speak. One last question. Uh -huh. When did Prescott come forward? 90, about the end of 96, something like that. About four years ago, five years. Hello. Uh, I just had a question about uh, if you find anything in the files on uh, any uh, references to Russia or any uh, type of um, uh, uh, thoughts about uh, coordinating with the Russians uh, in terms of um, uh, being able to identify, uh, um, you know, in, in other words, uh, not being able to uh, mistake uh, UFO mm. sightings for, you know, Cold War uh, um, missile launches. Not, not to do with mistaking things for Cold War missiles or aircraft, but in January 68 or December 68, I can't remember now, the Ministry of Defence did put a proposal together um, where they they wanted to work with the with the Russian government on the UFO subject. Now they put this proposal together and said, look, you know, we've had UFO sightings. We know you've had them because we've seen some of the literature and we've seen some of the files. Can we get together, put our heads together, and see what information we've got and try and come to some sort of conclusion? And the the British delegation didn't get any response back. The Russians refused to talk to them. At least they refused to speak to that one division of the MOD. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody else within the MOD, buried deeper, wasn't already in talks. Right. It, 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 and you said this happened in 68? Yeah, this was, it was definitely 68, yeah. Okay, okay. And you haven't found, uh, you haven't found a lot of paperwork that references no, that? No, all, all there is, there are three or four pages where somebody within the Ministry of Defence, for whatever reason, had picked up on the fact that somebody within Russia or a team within Russia was investigating these things mm -hmm. and they said, we've, we've got similar reports to yours, can we get together and, and see what's going on? And, and the Russians didn't say yes, didn't say no. They just didn't get back to them, they didn't reply. And the Ministry of Defence tried again 
and they also went through the American Defense Intelligence Agency and asked them to um, try and open a few doors with their contacts in Russia. And again, as far as we know, nothing came of it. But the department of the MOD that carried out this investigation, oh, sorry, that wanted to launch this investigation, was the office that Nick Pope worked in, the guy I mentioned earlier. Oh, yeah. And we know that his was only one of five or six departments involved. So it's not impossible that somebody else years before might have already made um, links with people in other countries anyway. So, you know, just because we get to see one official version doesn't mean that's the complete version. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, during the Cold War, how did the British government uh, feel about the U.S. government's crash retrieval of flying saucers and stuff, and how much uh, knowledge, science, and technology did the British government gain off of its own crash retrievals, and how did it feel about the Russian and the American government doing most of the crash retrievals while the British government did some of the crash retrievals of these UFOs stemming from these British Roswells? Um. If you look at all the reports that have surfaced um, where the British have been involved in a recovery, there's always been or there've always been allegations and rumours that the materials not necessarily gone over to the States, but to some extent the Americans have been involved in the coordination of, of what to do about the situation. For example, the case in the Second World War. Um, the story was that the British recovered this thing and didn't know what to do and approached the Americans and the Americans said this is what you do you don't say anything to the press or to the general public and we've had previous experience of, of this subject and uh, we've decided to keep the information under wraps and we prefer it if you did the same um, there's another case one I didn't mention tonight from 1964 where it was rumoured that a UFO crashed in a forest in the centre of England a place called Staffordshire and in this case, again, the story was that the Americans moved in and quickly contacted the British contingents and said, look, we were tracking this thing and lost it somewhere over England. We know it's come down. We'd appreciate your help in finding it wherever it is, but when you do, can you liaise with us and we'll brief you as to what to do with it. And the British apparently were quite happy to go along with that and realised that the Americans were essentially running the show as to how to deal with these incidents and that seems to be the case now as well. Well, thank you. Well, when the British government gained experience and knew what they were doing, did they ever get jealous of the Americans and the Russians on these crash retrieval things? Um, that I don't know. I mean, all, all I know for certain is that there's been liaison between Americans and the British as far as, you know, uh, personal opinions as to how it should be handled and what's said behind the scenes, I, I just don't know. I've not, I've not heard about that at all. Because it seems to me that, Amer that well, well, Americans and the Russians were getting the glory, Britain was getting the burden. Um, well, I suppose it depends how you look at it, but all I can say is that while there's, there's good evidence that these incidents occurred, I just don't know, you know what's said behind the scenes as far as jealousies and worries about sharing information. Anyone who might know those sorts of answers to those questions hasn't spoken out. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nick, for your okay. excellent talk. No problem. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Tom.